Jose. I mean, Jose, but Jose is more friendly to me. Hey everyone, happy May Day. This is Jose from the Jose channel, and I'm here to talk about all the wonderful leftist news happening around the world. Brazil has evicted almost all illegal gold miners from the Yanomami territory, its largest indigenous reservation, and will remove miners from six more reserves this year. In January, the government declared a humanitarian crisis in the Yanomami territory, which had been invaded by thousands of gold miners, threatening communities with firearms, spreading malaria, polluting rivers, and scaring off wild game, which led to malnutrition and hundreds of deaths, along with unspeakable violence on Yanomami women and girls. Junior Hekarari, head of the local Indigenous Health Council, estimated that 85% of the gold miners have left or been forced out of the reservation the size of Portugal, which extends along Brazil's northern border with Venezuela. Though long overdue, the eviction effort is an important step towards peace for the Yanomami people after so many years of suffering brought about by impunity during Bolsonaro's era. We hope they get that peace very soon. Again from Brazil, President Lula has cancelled the Bolsonaro era privatization plans underway for eight profitable state companies. The companies that will remain publicly run include the postal service Correros and the Empresa Brasil de Comunicao Preto, which manages the federal government's broadcast network. The president has called for ensuring a rigorous analysis of the impacts of privatization on the public service and on the market. He said, foreign capital is welcome to Brazil to make new investments and start new businesses, but not to buy our companies. In September of 2021, we reported on the GKN strike in Florence. 422 workers who were fired in an email had been occupying the plant fighting back against the capitalists' plan to maximize profits by laying workers off and relocating. At that time, 40,000 people flooded the streets of Florence in solidarity with the workers. They continued that occupation through 2022, making it the longest factory occupation in Italian history. We are happy to report that these workers saw a win recently when a court ruled that the company had to pay salaries to workers from the 9th of October. October onwards. The XGKN Factory Collective and those in solidarity with it are also taking their own initiative to move towards a green transition. To avoid a once great factory ending up as an empty shed, the workers are striving to recover it on a cooperative basis, advancing their own plan to produce photovoltaic panels, batteries, and cargo bikes. In late March, thousands of people again filled the streets of Florence to show solidarity with the workers and their vision. They chanted, Let's break the siege. Let's try to build the future. This is what solidarity looks like. On the 5th of April, tens of thousands of farmers and agricultural workers across India stormed the capital of New Delhi to protest the anti beautiful policies of the far-right Narendra Modi government. Protesters are making demands such as new policies to control inflation, the dissolution of anti-worker labor laws, fair prices for their crops, employment, and an increase in minimum wages. Last month, we reported that farmers marching in the state of Maharashtra were successful in forcing the government to accept all of their demands. Solidarity with all of those standing up against the BJP. Let's hope for another win. After 14 years of incarceration, three Sri Lankan Tamil political prisoners have finally been freed. 45-year-old Thiruvarul, 34-year-old Sulakshan, and 33-year-old Tharshan have been in jail ever since they were arrested under the Draconian Prevention of Terrorism Act in May of 2009. On Tuesday, April 4th, a court finally ruled that confessions given by witness statements in the case were inadmissible and the court could not prove their involvement in conspiracy against the government. Human rights groups have long argued that this controversial act has been used to suppress hundreds of political protesters in Sri Lanka, more often than not in a discriminatory fashion against the ethnic Tamil or minority Muslim community. Despite these conditions, prisoners have shown remarkable resiliency. During 2019 and 2020, for example, prisoners launched hunger strikes demanding their release, and many groups, such as the Voice of the Voiceless, have been campaigning for the release of Tamil political prisoners. New Mexico has just passed a bill to ensure all students receive free and healthy school meals. The bill provides free breakfast and lunch in every New Mexico school with fresh ingredients from local farmers and growers. Fantastic to see, food is a social right, not a commodity. On the 4th of April, the Cuban government won a lawsuit filed by CFR1 Limited, an investment firm based in the Cayman Islands, over two unpaid loans of 72 million euros in London's High Court. These loans were initially given to Cuba in the 1980s by European banks in a no longer existing currency, German Deutschmarks. In 2020, CRF, claiming to be the creditor of the loans, sued Cuba for the debt in London's High Court. However, 
Judge Sarah Cockerell, who oversaw the trial, ruled that the UK High Court had no jurisdiction to hear the case against the Republic of Cuba. Cuban Justice Minister Oscar Manuel Severa Martinez hailed the trial outcome as a victory and reported that this debt was nothing short of a vulture fund intended to harm the Cuban state, saying, There are documents that prove the intention to harm the country and affect the financial flows of the Cuban economy. And today, the International Workers' Day grassroots organizations across the United States are collectively sending 150 youth leaders to take part in Cuba's May Day celebrations. The Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center, a Christian grassroots organization in Havana, is hosting the visit, and participating organizations include the Palestinian Youth Movement, the People's Forum, and Black Lives Matter grassroots. People's Forum Executive Director Manolo de los Santos said of the visit, As young leaders in the United States, we want to affirm our right to learn, exchange, and build with the Cuban people who live under cruel sanctions and are kept on the list of state sponsors of terror for no credible reason. This historic delegation will renew the historic bonds of solidarity between people of Cuba and the United States despite Biden's aggressive foreign policy. On April 11th, the Chilean Chamber of Deputies approved a bill to reduce the work week from 45 to 40 hours over the course of the next five years. The bill also establishes increased overtime wages and compensation with up to five additional holidays and leaves open the possibility of establishing a four-day work week. It also establishes a two-hour time ban so that parents of children under 12 can work flexible hours, and it prevents employers from reducing salaries because of the change. The lower house of the Congress endorsed this with 127 votes in favor, 14 against, and 3 abstinations. The president signed the bill into law, and it enters into force today, this International Workers' Day. In union news, this month graduate students at Syracuse University voted overwhelmingly in favor of unionizing. The vote came in with 728 to 36 in favor of unionizing. Graduate workers can now begin the process of collective bargaining with Syracuse University. Workers began their unionization effort on January 17th with the goal of improving pay, better protections for workers, and improved healthcare. The unionization effort at Syracuse University comes during a historic wave of graduate students organizing and higher ed workers taking labor actions. Speaking of, over 9,000 Rutgers University employees have gone on an indefinite strike, which includes postdoctoral researchers, counselors, and graduate workers. The workers who have taken this important action are organized under three separate unions, including the the American Association of University Professors, American Federation of Teachers, the Rutgers Adjunct Faculty Union, and American Association of University Professors of Biomedical and Health Sciences of New Jersey. Rutgers University workers are currently striking over pay raises that can keep up with inflation, improved healthcare, and future job security. While some still see work in higher education as being detached from the cause of labor, Workers in higher education are facing the same difficult economic standards felt generally by the working class, and we've seen important union victories being won in higher education. For example, workers at Temple University won a 30-40% pay increase after a six-week strike earlier this year. Rutger worker demands include bringing base salaries up to $37,000 a year, which is still less than half of the median household income in New Jersey. Despite spending half a billion dollars on its athletic program since 2014, Rutgers University President Jonathan Holloway is using talk of budget deficits to deter union activity. Union leaders have pointed out that university officials have falsely predicted budget shortfalls for the last several years. Rutgers University workers are demonstrating solidarity in the face of adversity and stating that they're ready to strike until their demands are met. All power to the workers. The South African National Education, Health, and Allied Workers Union has ended its six-week strike in victory as South African government officials say they will revisit the demanded 10% raise and reconsider collective bargaining with the union. The South African government initially offered healthcare workers a 5% raise. Union representatives say that the 5% raise would not keep up with the rising cost of living in South Africa. Initially, the South African government decried the strike as unethical, which is a common tactic levied against workers in the healthcare sector. However, the union received broad support from other trade unions in the country, and the people united are forcing change. A historic settlement was reached in Philadelphia when the city announced it will pay $9.25 million in damages to more than 343 residents and activists who were tear gassed in the 2020 George Floyd protests. The agreement also includes policy changes to demilitarize the Philadelphia Police Department by requiring them to disengage from a federal program known as LESO 1033, which allows for local law enforcement to receive 
military equipment from the Department of Defense, a program which more than 8,000 state and municipal agencies currently participate in. Gwen Snyder, one of the injured protesters, said of the settlement, This historic settlement is not a complete victory, but it is absolutely a win. It is a win not because of the money, but because it means we were able to hold our city government and the police accountable for their violent attacks on black communities and on protesters exercising our First Amendment rights. On Twitter, Snyder urged everyone to continue the fight to get tear gas, zip ties, rubber bullets, and other dangerous and terrorizing measures banned permanently from ever being used against civilians to keep up the fight to abolish the police. Angela Davis returned an award from Atlanta City Council to show solidarity with activists who are fighting Cop City, the nickname they have given the huge militarized police training facility projected to be built in the southeast side of the city of Wheelany Forest. An Atlanta City Council member presented Davis with a plaque honoring her civil rights activism, yet six of the 15 council members that had signed the plaque had also approved the Atlanta Police Foundation plan to build Cop City despite overwhelming public opposition. At the conclusion of the presentation of the plaque, the crowd erupted into loud chants of Stop Cop City. Davis released a statement the next day apologizing for not having made clear her support for the fight to stop building the militarized training center. She then issued a video declaring that she was returning the award as a sign of her complete solidarity with the campaign to stop Cop City. Davis said, I want to salute all those who are involved in the Stop Cop City movement. I want to urge people everywhere to find ways to generate support for them. A jury ordered Tesla to pay over $3 million in a racial discrimination case brought by former employee Owen Diaz of the Fremont, California assembly plant. The Fremont plant is notorious for its alleged horrendously racist work environment. A jury originally awarded Diaz $137 million, but a federal judge threw out the award as excessive. In the second trial, a jury awarded Diaz $3 million. Although this is less money, it is encouraging that Diaz won compensation in court not once, but twice. The trial is separate from another case brought by the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, which said the agency had received hundreds of complaints from workers alleging racism and harassment at the Fremont factory. Let's hope this is just one of many wins to come. Over 80 women leaders from more than 30 countries in the Americas, Asia, and Europe founded Feminist International in Mexico City, Mexico on April 1st. The organization's mission is to promote a common agenda in favor of equality and a life free from gender-based violence. Mika Garcia, feminist activist and international affairs coordinator of the General Secretariat of Mexico's Rural Morena Party told People's Dispatch that Feminist International was founded following the call from women who are part of popular feminist movements with anti-capitalist, anti-racist, and decolonial class consciousness. The organization makes the following powerful statement in a manifesto they released online at the end of their founding event. The need for the struggle against patriarchy and capitalism demands the collective and international organization of feminists to provide a common agenda in favor of equality and lives free of male violence, strongly expressed in sexual and political violence, fighting for the legalization of the right to abortion and the full employment of all sexual, reproductive, and non-reproductive rights, for the redistribution of wealth and income, for the social and economic recognition of domestic and care work, with decent wages and legal rights, eliminating wage and employment gaps for an education that builds equality without sexist biases from the first cycles of training, for the need to expand the spaces of power occupied by women and LGBTI+, among other historical demands of feminism. Residents of British Columbia, Canada now have access to free prescription contraceptives, including the pill, copper IUDs, hormonal IUDs, an injection, an implant, morning after pill, no prescription needed. Residents can get contraceptives at most community pharmacies with prescription and BC services card without the need to register for coverage or fill out any forms. Tucker Carlson, the failed CIA applicant turned white nationalist Fox News host, has been fired from Fox News after 14 years. Tucker Carlson Tonight was among the most watched cable news shows in the US, in which Tucker used his platform to pump as much fear and hatred into the brains of millions of boomers as humanly possible, causing deep divisions in families and the greater social fabric. While right-wing conspiracy theorists view his departure as part of a satanic plot, the truth is not quite so supernatural. Tucker's firing comes hot off the heels of a lawsuit that cost Fox News $787 million and revealed a host of embarrassing messages where Tucker insulted management at Fox. 
There is also pending litigation from one of his former producers for the rampant misogyny and anti-Semitism behind the scenes, and a possible defamation lawsuit from a January 6 rioter who Tucker repeatedly alleged was an FBI plant. In the end, with all the legal penalties and costs of keeping Tucker on the air, it was good old capitalist profit motive that brought Tucker down. The bourgeois can screw over the working class as much as they want, but screw over billionaires and you can kiss your job goodbye. While we have no doubt that Tucker will be replaced with another ghoul, we can celebrate that one of the most effective fascist propagandists in American history no longer has a nightly platform on cable news. In late March, the anti-trans activist Kelly J. Keen Minchel, also known as Hosey Parker, was heckled, booed, and had juice doused on her by trans rights supporters who protested a speech she gave at an Auckland event. The protest was such a success that Parker was chased out of New Zealand a day before a rally she organized was set to take place. Her sudden departure meant her rally was cancelled. Labour Rainbow Caucus chairperson and MP Shannon Halbert stated, I can't be prouder of the Rainbow and Ally community for getting out to show solidarity for our trans community and really stand up against transphobia. Homosexuality has finally been decriminalized in the Cook Islands after years of tireless work by activists. Prior to this change, men engaging in same-sex acts could be jailed for up to five years, and those hosting these acts on their premises could face 10 years of imprisonment. Under these new crimes, Sexual Offenses Amendment Bill, coming into effect on the 1st of June, any clauses pertaining to the illegality of consensual sexual acts between men will be removed. Prime Minister Mark Bowen said in a tweet that it was a historic day for his Cook Islands party to stomp out discrimination of the LGBT community. In November of 2022, we covered the occupation of Ship Hole, which is the largest airport in the Netherlands and one of the largest airports in Europe. 500 protesters occupied the area on foot and on bicycles and shut down air traffic by private jets. Since then, local activists have continued the campaign against private flights with an added demand to lessen noise pollution. Thanks to their tireless activism, Schiphol has decided to ban overnight flights to cause fewer noise disturbances, and they have also pledged to ban all private flight. This is majorly good news as private jets produce a disproportionate amount of carbon emissions. Activism work. Our heartfelt gratitude to everyone involved in this campaign. Thousands of people organized organized by the Bloc Gas Alliance participated in protesting and disrupting the European Gas Conference in Vienna through days of civil disobedience. They went on to block the freight tracks operated by OMV, one of Austria's largest oil and gas companies, and protest outside of their headquarters. On Twitter, the Alliance pledged to continue growing and taking action against fossil capitalism. They wrote, we will continue to block fossil criminals everywhere until climate breakdown and hashtag colonial violence are stopped. Thank you to activists putting their bodies on the line and facing repression to fight to protect our one and only home. Comrades, if you have good news, please send your stories to totalliberationpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jam. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. Thank you to Mexi, Nick, Catherine, and Ash for script writing and production. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. And of course, myself. The world is great, it makes me mad, but at least I get to talk about it with Jose. Jose, for hosting this one, I, I guess I'm thanking myself. And from your humble host, Jose, I thank you all for listening to this wonderful news, and I hope you come by next month to hear even more great positive leftist news. If you'd like to support the show, please go to patreon.com forward slash positive leftist news, or you can give us a one-time tip via PayPal. The link is in the description box below. 